This is the Let's Talk Leadership podcast. My name's Ellie Greeny. And my name's Sandra Patel-Stewart. On this podcast, we will be interviewing some of the UK's greatest tech leaders. We'll be discussing war stories, battle scars, and their learnings from their journeys. Hopefully, you will pick up some great tips, learn from others' experiences, and have a good laugh along the way. Hi everyone, thank you very much for tuning into the Let's Talk Leadership podcast. Very excited today that we've got the fantastic Mark Kitchen on. Hi Mark. Hi there, how are you? Very good, thank you. Really pleased to have Mark as a guest. Mark is the head of technology at Lab Bible. If you're not aware, I'm sure you are aware because I'm sure everyone's seen it all over Instagram and Facebook, but the Lad Bible Group provide news and entertainment and community to a global audience. And they are actually, interestingly, I found out today that they're the 10th most visited site in the UK by Alexa, which is incredible. It's amazing to show how much outreach you've got. So um, yeah, really pleased to have you on the podcast, Mark. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Mark. And I'm Sandra. Nice to meet you. Hi there. Good to meet you. Good, good. Um, so I always like to start these off with um, just getting to know um, you in a little bit more detail, letting the, telling the viewers and listeners um, more about your journey, where that started, how it started, um, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I'll be trying to think of how to do this without taking hours and hours, but um, I mean, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It, there's nothing unusual in my past. Um, it all started sort of when I was about 11 years old, my dad bought home as an X Spectrum. Um, and it, one of those things where people of a certain age will remember these things, but used to be able to buy uh, magazines um, and used to be able to code uh, games and things uh, direct from the magazine. So I used to sit there tapping the keys while my uh, brother read out all the instructions. Um, and you used to have to do a set of debugging sometimes if it didn't work, go back over the work and make sure you put all the right things in. And that's sort of where my love of coding first started. Um, from, I actually wanted to be a, a dentist when I was at school, um, but I found out that you had to do three, uh, the three sciences at GCSE, and I, I bottled that, I couldn't be bothered. So I ended up doing uh, <laughs> GCSE and IT, um, which sort of got me on that path, really. And it's sort of fairly uneventful. You know, I went through college, I went through university, I did a degree in computer studies at Huddersfield University, which was great. Um, and then I left to find a job in the big wide world and I was quite happy to work anywhere in the country. I'd worked in Swindon on my uh, year out from university, so I was quite happy to go anywhere. Uh, and I ended up working less than half a mile from my mum and dad's house in Gaffer. Uh, so oh, really? <laughs> so, I mean, it was bizarre. Uh, it was like a company, it was called Yak Labs, which is a bit of an odd uh, acronym, but uh, I think mm-hmm. people in circles will understand what that stands for. But um, there's about eight people working there. It was owned by one guy that used to uh, own the company. Um, and it was, it was great. And we used to do everything. I mean, I, I, I wired up, we wired up the uh, St. Gemma's Hospice. Uh, then we did their first network there. Uh, I remember crawling across, you know, through ceiling tiles and, you know, crimping up boxes on the walls so they could use mm-hmm. the computer offices. And we did that, you know, wow. to uh, mm-hmm. charity thing. Uh, which was great but we also did software we did websites um, and it was all sort of quite pioneering at the time it was early days when we actually had to go out and convince companies to have a website which is you know now it's just taken granted that every company has a yeah. website uh, but it involved sales as well i had to send mail shots out to people to to get um, to get business and i had to go out and visit uh, visit uh, companies which i'll be honest for I, i'm you know quite an anxious person at the best of times so and that, that you know, sort of blew down a few walls for me as far as you know getting myself out there and actually putting myself in, in out of my comfort zone mm. um, and after about five years I went to uh, moved down to London to, to join the big dot-com boom that was going on at the time and I worked for a company called Sportal which were one of the biggest sports websites in the world at the time and they did uh, a lot of sponsorship around the year 2000 football tournament and uh, they were a big thing, but they were just hemorrhaging money, like all, well, not like all, but a lot of dot-com companies at the time. And uh, it was constant VC money just being plowed into the company. Now, it, it did eventually go bust about four months after I left. I actually left because my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, got pregnant while we were down there. Oh, so, wow. uh, 
<laughs> we decided that London wasn't the best place to bring up a new child. Uh, it was, a, to be honest, it was a bit of a shock for both of us. Um, <laughs> back up to get uh, help from the, the parents um, and grandparents, as they are now. Uh, and coming back up to Leeds, I joined a company called Team Talk. And at the time, they just had a few websites, um, teamtalk.com, which is still around now and still got some of the original people working on it. Um, but in the space of about six years working there, I went from just a normal web developer up to a, a, a senior developer. The company was bought a couple of times and then eventually about six years after I started working, they got bought by Sky. And that's how yes. I did it. <laughs> so uh, even though my record does show 17 years of uh, service with Sky, it sort of split yeah. up in ah. six years of working for Team Talk, UK betting, sporting life, and eventually 365 Media before it got bought by, uh, by Sky. Um, but uh, so yeah, that, that for, we were about 50 people at the time working for Sky Leeds. And this was before Sky Bet actually came over to Leeds. So, you know, it's uh, sort of quite proud to be able to say that we were that embryonic first stages of Sky's presence in Leeds. Um, Sky, Sky Bet moved in down the road from us not long after. We were working in um, Apsley House at the time, which I think is where they did to it. Actually the same floor that they're currently in. Yeah, um, I went to visit them. Yeah, I went to visit them about two years ago, and uh, it was very strange walking around that soon. Mm -hmm. Because it feels like Sky's been in the dock forever. Yeah, yeah, uh, but a lot. Of, I think that's the thing. A lot of people think that Sky started with the dock, and other people realise that Sky yeah. were here. But um, yeah, we were working at Apsley House, uh, literally on the same floor that Infinity works. Uh, I think we're still in. Um, but we had, we eventually moved over to Sky Bet's uh, place in Wellington Place, um, and then. Uh, well, I'd, I'd got to a point where I'd sort of, I'd become a scrum master uh, because I sort of saw my strengths as, as being a bridge between the development team and managers and, and people that didn't necessarily understand tech. Mm -hmm. I also worked with a, a guy down in um, Sky Head offices down at Osterley who was a scrum master. I'd never heard of scrum master before. And what he did running that project was something I'd never seen before. Uh, you know, I was very, very used to working in that sort of waterfall we didn't, even, we didn't even call it waterfall. It was, it was just, we had a process where a bunch of people gave, gave the tech team some work. We did it, sent it back to them three months later. They said, oh, no, it's not like that. Sent it back. And then after another three months of development, they said, actually, we've changed his mind. It's now I want it like this. So <laughs> seeing this sort of new fangled scrum master type role and seeing how well this guy managed the team and, and you know, got involved every two weeks. He used to go down for the scrum mm -hmm. session. Uh, do the planning, the retrospective, and I absolutely loved it. And I, I could see where we could, uh, you know, do that up in Leeds. Uh, I could see where it was beneficial. Um, luckily, we had a change of management there, and uh, my old boss, Matt Grest, came in um, and sort of allowed us to do these things. There's definitely a sea change there of uh, command and conquer for the dev team through to, you know, Matt, who was much more of a sort of inclusive manager and, and you know, asked for our ideas, which was quite novel at the time. So I ended up becoming a scrum master um, together with an ex-colleague called Jonathan Hodd. We were you know, both um, the first sort of scrum masters as guy in Leeds. Uh, then we moved uh, And then I'd done that for a few years and I'd been at Sky for what sort of 14 years at the time. And I think I just got to the point where I thought I, there's nothing else I can do here. Uh, you know, not really anywhere I can go. As I say, we're probably upwards of 50 to 60 people at that point. And there wasn't much happening. Um, so I thought I'll just see what's out there. I've got a couple of job offers. Um, told Mark Grest at the time that I was looking at looking to leave. And he told me what was about to happen. And what was about to happen was, you know, 500 plus people moving, either moving from London to Leeds or being hired in Leeds. And I just thought, I can't miss this. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not to expand what I'm doing, but, uh, but for a company that I know how it works and um, that I've been working for a long time. Um, you know, gave me that comfort of doing something new, but in a, in a surroundings that I was used to. Um, so I actually, I mean, my official job title was Scrum Master, but I was sort of um, employee number three in the first team that came up from London, which was the digital service team. And that's headed up by uh, Paul Lemon, who came over from BBC. Uh, and Gazala Bibi, who's, I can't show her Gazala now, who's Scrum yeah, Master. Yeah, I know Gazala. Uh, yeah, so she, she, she moved over from Skybet uh, to Sky to do that. Um, and uh, the three of us pretty much set out, it was like working for a startup, it was, it was really good. Uh, you know, we set out all the ways of working we wanted, you know, we had to uh, understand how uh, laptop purchases worked in Sky, all the things we 
thought of before all the admin stuff that we, we needed to deal with hiring how do we hire you know working with very quickly didn't it? Or, or from i guess where i was sat it seemed to happen pretty quick yeah with a lot of hard work um, <laughs> we, 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 we've got some internal uh, recruits in that you, you'll you'll know quite well and um and the, the, yeah the, the the targets were really really tight we 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 were expecting to get a lot of people in very quickly. I think the first tranche was about 100 people. Um, I think we managed that in you know a few months, four, four, five months ish. Um, mm -hmm. I was really looking after the uh, the service app team as, as scrum master, uh, but I did a lot of uh, interviewing for for a lot of positions there myself as well. I was interviewing for BAs, QAs, um, devs. Um, yeah, the recruitment team, that was huge and they did such it was like that was when it was like Sue and Sean, right? And they kind of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sue and Sean and yeah. yeah. Sophie as well. And uh, yeah, all, we all worked really well together. It just it sort of it sort of just seemed to come together really well. Um uh, and yeah, we, we did a really good job of that. And off the back of that, I think I've been doing that for about a year and I just settled into sort of the routine of being a scrum master for the, the service app team again. And I just thought, all right, well, I'm back where I was now. You know, all that was really exciting. I'm a school master again. So again, I, uh, I tapped up Mr. Grest and said, uh, anything else I can do? Um, I think it was about, it was around the same time we were doing reviews and KPIs and things like that. And I said, you know, have you got any ideas of what can put my KPIs? And he went, you fancy heading up a team yourself, uh, you know, rather than do it for Paul? So I said, yes. And uh, it was very scary, very stressful, uh, but it was probably the biggest achievement in my career, I think. Um, we set up a team of, I think it's about 35 to 40 people. I can't remember the exact numbers. And it was a digital agency team. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I looked after that team from scratch to uh, completion uh, and further. Um, and when you officially moved into the head of, head of tech role? Sort of. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Matt had had the, uh, the side off to get a, an official head of tech for that. <laughs> I, 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 definitely, I definitely felt like I was... Um, being reviewed uh, for, 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 the, for the role um, uh, as, I, as I went along. Um, but eventually, once the team was in and I felt it was about appropriate time, I did go to Matt and said, I've been doing this a few months now. Is it possible that I could have the head of tech, head of tech role? And uh, I got that. Um, it's a nice feeling, Matt, when you get the new title to go with it. Well, I've never, I've never asked for anything like that. No, I, don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever asked for a peer rise in my life. And I don't think I've ever asked for a job title change or a promotion. Um, obviously, you know, we're going from Scrum Master in Sky Sports to Scrum Master in the Digital Service Team. I was doing a very different job. But the mm. title didn't change. And I had asked for that, but, you know, yeah, the job title was the same. But it was the first time I'd ever gone to a boss and said, I think I should be having that job title now. Uh, and it quite, it quite, quite Sounds annoying. like you were doing a lot more than a Scrum Master role. <laughs> Oh yeah, I definitely was. But uh, a long you know, time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was. I think I was doing it for about six months before mm -hmm. I got the title. Easily six months, actually. Think about it. But it was good. I, I mean, I really enjoyed the, the work of the people that I hired there. Um, yeah, it was a really good team. Um, mm -hmm. good and team. to create something like that from scratch as well, that's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, that's the thing. Um, you know, I think when when you can create this team from scratch, you can. You can it sounds really weird, but you can, you can sort of mould it in your... Um, yeah. As it were. That sounds quite... Yeah. Quite, quite nice. It's so an opportunity to get, get your teeth stuck into something, really. Meet yeah. challenging, isn't it? Um, yeah. and, then you, and then you went to move to Lad Bible, didn't you? How did that come well, about? I think it's, it's probably a similar thing. Again, I, mean, I went through a long period of my life being a developer. I'm not really thinking about career. And then it's almost like once I got a taste for doing new things, um, I, 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 as soon as I've sort of done, done it and been there and, and I was just doing the job day to day, mm -hmm. I, I was missing that sort of challenge again. Um, so, you know, the, the, I, I, I also started looking after the digital engagement team there as well, which that look after the sky.com website. So I had about 60 people, 65 people. Um, and then we start chat, started to change the... Um, the, the structure of the teams a little bit so there was all the heads of tech I think it was four of us or five of us at the time sort of started doing slightly different roles rather than looking after a team or looking after a function uh, and I didn't uh, that didn't sort of sit well with me because I, I like look after people and it was, it was less of the people management so um, I literally started sort of putting feelers out um, 
so I've got a couple of interesting um, tentative uh, offers to, to interview for jobs. But Solly, uh, Solomon, Solly, Solomon, Solly's his nickname, but he's the founder of Lab Bible. Um, Solly sent me a message on LinkedIn, do you fancy coming and have a chat? And he didn't offer me a job or anything like that. He didn't say there was a job available. But I was just intrigued. I thought, I, you know, Lord, I knew Lab Bible, I knew all of them, and I thought, that's, that's, I just want to know how they make money, to be honest. <laughs> I went over to That's Lab so crazy as well, but it came direct from Solly as well. Yeah, I, I look back now and he, 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 I don't think he admits it, but I think he was, I think the recruitment team was using his LinkedIn, but I, th I think, I don't know. Um, I mean, looking I back, maybe, he maybe he did. directly or because that's unusual. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it was a role that was working for him, directly for him. So, and I think um, some of the people that they'd hired in the past didn't quite work out. I think I think he wanted to be the person that sort of led the recruitment there to make sure that he was happy with the person that he got in. Yeah. I basically just went and had a beer with him. Um, it absolutely blew me away with his passion and his, his knowledge of the business that he was in. Uh, it wasn't what at all what I was expecting. You know, he, he was incredibly knowledgeable about what he was doing and how they were making money and, and what they were going to do going forward. And I sort of realised they were, they were a company. It wasn't just two guys in a bedroom knocking out videos. Because um, that's how it started, right? They started from university. Yeah. They started the business, just a couple yeah, of young they, guys. They, yeah, they were, they were, they were actually they were Leeds University, ironically. Um, oh, right. And yeah, they, they were trying to get a, a student accommodation website uh, off the ground. And in doing that, they found this uh, Facebook site called Loud Bible that someone was running that had a lot of users. And they thought, oh, we could use those users to... to um, to push the, the traffic to the, um, the student accommodation website. Now, what actually happened was that they, they, the lab, they took over the lab Bible page and they just absolutely smashed it. You know, they, they, they sent their numbers through the roof. So they thought, mm. let's not do student accommodation, let's just concentrate on this. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, I, think it's, I think we just had our eight year anniversary. Nice. So he, he, he offered me, the, I went over the next day to talk to his business partner, the, the co-founder I am, and uh, one of the exec, well, executive um, like advisors, and I got offered the job there and then. So within 24 hours, um, I'd spoke to the founder and be offered a job. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> to be then. <laughs> so how, um, so you've been there for a couple of years now? About two years, is been it? been there for two years and three months. Three, two years and three months, yeah. And uh, it's been completely different to anything I was used to at Sky. Um, it's like chalk and cheese. It's, it's some of the issues that I had at Sky are completely not issues at uh, at Lad Bible. And I've got access to the founders. I can talk to the, uh, mm. the people the company directly. So you know any issues or, or suggestions can go directly to them. They might not see. Yes, they might say it's completely ridiculous, but at least they're there if I need to ask them. Um, you know, it's nice just to be able to WhatsApp the owner of a company and say we're thinking of doing this and get an instant you know reaction. Yeah. On the flip side, um, I've. Since I got there, I think I've done everything. Um, you know, I've, went, I've gone from maybe 65 people at Sky to what at, at one point is six people working that team, um, mm. of which I think one of those is still here. Uh, so I've completely rebuilt the tech team from scratch there. And the tech team uh, encompasses a lot more than I'm used to as well. So we've got IT support, data science, UX design, product, um, and the dev team as well. So. I'm looking after things that I've never had to look after before, uh, which has been an eye opener. I've also loaded the dishwasher, swept the floor, made cups of tea. You know, so I, I, I've pretty much pretty much done everything there. Oh, uh, yeah. How many have you got in your team now? Then I think it's 22. I was just trying to work this out, but yeah, I think it's 22 now. As I say, we were down to sort of bare bones at one point, um, and I, I had to be quite creative in in how we staffed the team and how we got how we got a team together. Uh, but yeah, with, with a space of about a year, we had nearly a full uh, dev team and design UX. And then I spent about another six months putting together an IT support team because the IT support team that we had left through various reasons, not not various reasons, but just sort of uh, different reasons. And I literally got to the point where it was just me and the contractor and I was having to deal with you know people's laptops breaking, Wi-Fi not working. Um, oh, Wow. Uh, and as I say, it's great fun. I, I think, you know, the because I can, I work because I work for the boss. It's it's very easy for me to say to them, look, the situation is this. I'm going to try my best. And I'm going to get some people in, but people are going to have to be patient for that time. Yeah. And then if people do get, you know, a bit shirty about the laptop being broken too long. Then at least I can go to the boss and say, look, can you have a chat with them and explain the situation? Yeah. 
which is a great position to be in. You, uh, you want to get the right people in as well, don't you? Like totally, and I, that's a big philosophy of mine. I, you know, I've built three. Well, I've built two teams now, um, and uh, you know, the philosophy of team is is, is paramount to me. Um, mm. Retention rate with staff. Uh, I'd had a good retention rate at Sky. I think we had that team had one of the best retention rates in, the, in that building in Leeds. And in Lab Bible, I'm pretty sure that ours is the best retention rate of any team in Lab Bible. So on, on, no, it would be really good to, um, given that we've, we've been talking about teams and how you've, you've obviously revamped the teams, you've grown them from scratch. Um, it'd be really good to tell our listeners more about your leadership style. Um, and how you how do you think your how would you describe your leadership style? But also, how do you think your teams would describe your leadership style? So, this is a it's not a difficult question to answer. Me, I've always had almost crippling imposter syndrome, and I know that's really uh, I think that's a, a term that's sort of really come into the tech industry in the last sort of five years. Uh, but it's a real thing. Um, and the problem you, you have as a leader is if you don't have a little bit of that, a little bit of um, uh, uh, hubris, I think is the right word, then you know you can come across as narcissist, and then you don't, you, your personality doesn't fit very well with with other people. But so it's difficult for me to answer it without internally me cringing and going, "Oh, I can't believe I said that." But, <laughs> but I'm about to pick myself up anyway. Um, I think I. I'm very open. I'm, I try to be as transparent as possible. Um, the Sky was, don't get me wrong, Sky was a great place to work. I was there for a long time. But over the last sort of three years I was there, especially as I got, you know, a bit higher in the managerial uh, structure, you'd start to see a lot of the politics, um, some of, you know, and some of which was you know, quite toxic. So um, I, I try to be open as possible. Um, I try to... You know, I, I want the team to understand what the business is doing because uh, yeah. they need action. It's amazing. You, you know, you think you can put a team of devs in a room, just throw a bit of work on them and they get it done. But believe it or not, they actually want to know what they're working on and why, you know, which, which is something that baffles some people. Um, mm -hmm. But they I do. Agree. So, you know, they, they, they want to have a feeling of, of accomplishment. 100%. I agree. I think that's really important that you, um, you take your people with you throughout that journey. And... Um, you know, to get more buying from you guys as well, which it sounds like you um, a strong believer in. Yeah. Of. Now, I think there's a balance to be had. I think that's where my strength is. I think, I think I can balance those two out. So I know when to tell people the whole truth. I don't know when to maybe just keep things back. Um, it can sometimes be detrimental to give some give people everything, lots and all. Yeah. You know, what you don't want to do is to be, uh, you know, say to them, oh, everything's just, all the part and the management team don't know what they're doing you, you, that doesn't you know it just leads to people wanting to leave and these things pass as well you know it could be that you're fighting fires you know upwards or, or around you but you, if you do what you can to, to put them out and then the team don't need to know and everything you know but you do want to at least be able to say to them here's what the management are thinking about direction of the company, you know, and the, the good thing in Lad Bible is actually they're, they're really cool with that, are they, the founders, you know, they're quite happy for people to know what direction is, where we're going. Um, so yeah, I think balancing out that sort of, uh, yeah. yeah. So I suppose- it, it's, it's, interest, it's interesting, because you said to me earlier that your role was head of tech, when, prior to recording some, so you won't know this, but you said, it's just a bit like being a scrum master really, but just a little bit on a bigger scale and like different different things. But it sounds like the way that you described your leadership style, like, particularly when you're on about kind of knowing what to disclose and knowing not, like, because the fires will go out at some point, so you don't want to over, it's kind of like that scrum master, like keeping the blockers away from your team, isn't it? And yeah. like looking after your little team properly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um... A lot of it's counselling as well. It sounds really, again, it sounds really weird. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, I think a, a good leader needs to be able to empathise, uh, mm. or at least, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the right term? Um, uh, emotional intelligence, that's what, that's what I'm looking for. Mm. It, you, you need to understand what people are going through. It's very easy sometimes when, especially when you've got two people in the team that are rubbing each other up the wrong way, it may be easier to say, well, the reason that's happening is because they're being an idiot. And, and they've complained to me because they're being an idiot. So you can just go and discipline the person that's being an idiot. 
but nothing's ever black and white. And, you know, people are going through their own, their own things. And if they are being disruptive, they've got the reasons for that. And you need to figure out what they are. You know, yes, that person might need disciplining at some point, but if you can correct that behaviour by understanding the things that they're going through first, then, you know, it doesn't have to come to that. Uh, but, but on the flip side, um, you know, I think the other thing that I've become a lot better at in the last sort of three, four years is knowing when to cut your losses. Um, you know, I have had points where I have dragged my heels far too long with disruptive staff, uh, assuming that we will be able to change their behaviour, whereas actually, you know, you always get to a point where you've lo you lost the dressing room, as it were, you know, the, the, the staff have watched you drag on for so long with this disruptive member of staff that they've, they've, they've lost their faith in you and their trust in you. So I have learned that to, to, to you know, knock these things on the head as quick as possible, deal with things head on. Um, that's a big thing as well that I've had to learn over the years is that um, you can't let things fester. You know, if you've got, if you've got an issue uh, and you need to talk to someone about it, you talk to someone about it as quick as possible. That, that works upwards and downwards. You know, if I, as I say, I've, 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 you know, I've suffered with a bit with anxiety in my life, imposter syndrome, and it's very easy my default when I'm dealt when facing a difficult uh, situation is to put it on my to-do list and then keep looking at it on my to-do list every day. I think I'll do that. I'll do that. Two, three weeks later, I haven't dealt with it. Still there. <laughs> all hell's kicked off. So I, I, although I don't always do this, but you know, if I can, I try and deal with things as soon as possible. Uh, mm. These things sorted. Uh, it is team, tough though, isn't it? When you're leading, when, when the people you're leading are highly skilled people as well, which they are in tech, and you know that those people are hard to come by, but like you say, sometimes if they are, like you need to deal with disciplinaries and things like that, it can be tougher when it's one person in a team that's the only person that knows this system or they're vital to the team. Sometimes I guess that makes your decisions a little bit more difficult. Yeah, and that definitely leads to that sort of procrastination about that, that sort of thing. You know, I, I, it happened a couple of times. You know, once, once I'll be honest, I've done it and I've seen it happen in another team where, you know, a subject matter expert and you're like well i can't really get rid of them because this this and this i i've never been in a position where since then where i've not said right we're going to have to let this person go um and not being able to cope with it you know i mean mm -hmm. yeah, it's nice to have subject matter experts and things go quicker when they're around but you'll always find a way uh, you know th there's contractors out there you can get people in you know yeah of course make you you know, usually people at my level have got, uh, you know, enough contacts to be able to call on someone in an emergency if we need to. It's much better not to have that subject matter expert there if they are causing problems with other people in the team. Uh, it sounds exactly. like, I, think, I think that's actually one side of me, you know, talk about how the team perceive your style. I think that's something that people probably don't realise that I've had to do in the last sort of four or five years. You know, there's a lot of people that I've worked with for a long time that just think I'm the nice guy, that I'm you know, the smiley nice guy, and I'm always smiling in the office, and people say that a lot, you know, you, you, I don't know when you're annoyed because you're always smiling, but you know, I, have, I have had to learn, and I think this is something for other people that are aspiring to, to be managerial, um, going to managerial positions, you, have, you are going to have to make some difficult decisions, and mm -hmm. it's going to be you that's got to make them, and it, you know, don't procrastinate on it, make a decision and do it, um, and it will, it will feel much better when you have because it's it's a way it's done. You've got to rip them band-aids off, haven't you? Sometimes I think. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. On that note, on that note, <laughs> quite nicely, it'd be brilliant if you can tell us. I think as listeners, it's it's good to hear about examples of how you kind of feel like you learned this and developed. But we all know that we learn everything through our toughest times. Like we're all learning so much at the moment during lockdown about ourselves and our family and our companies and everything. But I think you learn when you're in the trenches of it all, you really do learn a lot. So it'd be amazing if you can tell us maybe a couple of war stories that kind of, that you went through and what you learned and came out with the other side of it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I guess that really shaped you, I think. Yeah, it? how long have you got? Because it's to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've got a few really quick, there's some quick examples that I've got of this where, I mean, God, you know, when you say learning, I've learned just don't do that again. Um, so <laughs> as a developer, there's two really good, uh, well, one, one really good example where um, I, I moved the root directory of a live web server to my own personal directory. So, uh, which meant that the whole thing just went down. And because I'd moved the root directory, the most clever people in the team didn't know how to get it back. And it took about three hours and the website was down for three hours. That was the team top website. I don't mind saying that. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
and that was awful. Uh, and oh god! <laughs> obviously, there were, there were learnings for that for me personally, for people in the company, our 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 systems admins. You know, oh. basically, don't let people have admin rights to live servers. <laughs> But don't let them forego on live. You know, don't let them forego on production. Uh, and <laughs> just soon afterwards, we, uh, you know, we, we had a lot more uh, development service. That was that was an awful, awful day. Um, <laughs> probably, you know, that that's that's a that's a really hard, a bad example of me just messing up. But there, you know, as a team, um, great example. We we created a, a football score centre application for Sky Sports quite early on after they bought us. Uh, and it's uh, it's quite new at the time, and you, know, you get score center apps on on your phone and, and that sort of thing. But this was really flash that sort of dates it because the you know, flash has been dead for a few years now. Um, but it was a flash front end, and I did a lot of the code on the back end. But it was built on servers that we were already using for content on the website, just articles. And uh, it wasn't really fit for live live scores. It wasn't fit for a lot of users. And it all looked sound. We tested it ourselves. These were in the days where, you know, in, in that development team, we didn't have QA, we didn't have uh, load testers, we didn't have um, uh, business analysts or solutions architects, really. Um, so we just sort of, you know, did as best, put it out live. And the whole thing just went down the first day. Within about five minutes, it stopped working, and we had millions of people trying to get onto it. And they were promoting it on Sky Sports as well for, on you know, Dirt Sock and Saturday. So, oh, wow. yeah, so this thing that we were promoting on the TV just didn't work. And it didn't work properly for probably about two years. It was, it was just, it never worked. We, we built it on, you know, we, we, we just spent, we, we spent weekends and weekends tinkering with it. I, I was on call at the time, so I used to spend, I, I probably spent months in total supporting it on the weekend. And the learnings of that, looking back, uh, you know, it was obviously not fit for purpose, the platform we built it on. And if I was going to go back and have my time again. We did just start it from scratch. You know, the first day we saw it wasn't working, we just go, let's just completely start from scratch. On top of that, we, uh, you know, obviously now teams have testers, teams have BAs, teams have, you know, mm -hmm. testing, for example. If we'd have load tested it, we'd have known straight away that it wasn't fit for purpose. But it wasn't something we thought about at the time. And, um, you know, we were, we were quite naive. And the, the, the team that we put together there were all really good people, decent devs, but we didn't have any sort of sight of the things that we do nowadays in dev that we take for granted. You were just so focused on it that you wanted it to work that you couldn't kind of step away yeah. and say, Look, just call it a day, guys, we need to start from scratch. Yeah, and there was no one in the company at that time that was really doing any sort of R&D and, and, and looking at sort of future uh, technology. So it's like, it's like log testing, that, that stuff that we do just as a matter of course nowadays. No one really thought about it. And it was, it was bizarre to look back and think, you must have had a clue that that wasn't going to work. But yeah. 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 I think Gordon, Gordon Cullen, when he came on, he said about a similar story, I think, that where he said, it, like, we just kept trying to make this thing work and it just never worked. But, like, hindsight is a wonderful thing, yeah. isn't it, when you stood away from it. But when you're in it and you really, like, you're passionate about it, like you said, you'd already committed so much time to it. You don't want to walk away, do you? Yeah, it also takes a certain amount of guts from so probably management as well, because, you know, if the devs turn around to you and say, oh, to fix this, it's going to take us another six months to completely rewrite it. There's, there's no appetite for that in, in, in that, those circles. You know, it's like, mm. we've, just, we've just spent six months writing it, and now you're telling me we're going to spend six months doing it again. They're advertising it on TV. If you want to <laughs> rip it down and start again. Yeah. That gave you a couple of sleepless nights then. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that was, I mean, that was, a, that was a bad time. That was, a, yeah, that was, that was really hard. Yeah. <laughs> What about your sort of past, it's probably what, like three, four years now that you've kind of been in a head of role, but prior to that you were doing leadership with, within your scrum master role. But what key learnings do you think then that you've learned as a, as a leader that you think the listeners would be able to benefit from? Um, I've probably touched on a couple of those already. I, obviously, you know, grasping the nettle and, and having hard conversations, you know, you need to learn that, that's a part of the job um, and you need to be comfortable with that. I think the problem is that probably only comes with experience and doing it. Um, so I would say if you have those difficult things to do, if you have a difficult conversation to have, don't let your mind engage, don't let your mind talk you out of it, just go and have that conversation and you'll feel much better. Um, yeah, being resilient to, to change is very important. Um, I, I can't think of it, I mean just, 
look at, looking at the desk moves that I've had in the last four, four or five years, both at Sky and at, uh, at uh, Lab Bible, you know, I know it sounds sort of frivolous, I'm just, just moving desks, but a lot of people get quite stressed about that. And that happens yeah. like every six months. You know, and it's oh, a- tell Sandra that, because Sandra <laughs> moves us every week in our office. I was just about to say, I thought when you were saying, when you were about to talk about how often you had desk moves, it was going to be less than six months. I think we must have one every month. <laughs> Yeah, but it's something that stresses people out, and I think, but yeah, it can be. Yeah, it absolutely, can be. But um, you know, it, <laughs> it's, it's a good analogy for what tends to happen in other parts of the business. It's just a very easy, an easy uh, comparison to make. You know, it change a lot, and uh, I think they would change quicker if some people in the business wanted them to. But uh, people don't handle that sort of thing very well, and I personally have never handled that sort of stuff very well in the past. And I've I've definitely had to get used to. You know, very, very off the, off, especially at Lab Bible, you were moving very fast. And if we can see a market that we want to go into that requires some tech, we sometimes have to drop everything and just change it. Um, yeah. just different. Um, and just like changes in structure in a company. Sky were very good at changing structure quite often. Um, you know, different people move, moving off to different things. And that's great for some people. They love changing that job every six months. And Sky's very good at that. They're very good at saying, oh, if you want to go and be a, a QA, uh, over there then uh, when you've been when you've done that job then go and give it a go and that's great i love that um but you know, to, to actually say to someone oh we're now moving teams we've got no budget for that team anymore you've got to go work with that team it's really stressful for people and mm. able to talk people through that as a leader is mm. really important you know you need to be able to explain them to, to the very calmly why it's happening you need to get them on side uh, you know, you, you can't be going in there and sitting there. And it goes back to something else I was saying earlier about what's not. You can't be going in there and saying, "Oh, it's all changing again. We've got a blooming move." This yeah. is great. It's how you deliver. It's about yeah. how you deliver it, isn't it? And that would be delivering it in a negative. You know, you're starting off with a negative. Um, that leads us quite nicely onto um, our next question around um, motivating teams. Um, obviously, you've touched on how. Um, you would manage and coach teams throughout change and adapting to change. Um, and we've all had to experience a lot of change recently. Um, so it'd be quite good to, to get to know in a little bit more detail how you've adapted um, to the recent changes, how you've unite, helped unite and motivate the teams within Lab Bible, especially given the current times. Yes, I think... From a development specific point of view, I think it's been quite easy. I want to say easy, uh, but I think we don't have a, a home working policy really at uh, Lab Bible, um, and people don't really work from home that often. So this has been a, this has been a big change. We're a very sociable company. You know, a lot of people we, we have you know, quite frequent uh, nights out. People like being in the office together. However, in tech, we're all used to having some sort of home working. In other, in other roles and you know Sky were very good at that um, so from so my personal point of view I, I haven't got a problem with it and m- m- much of the team don't either they're used to using tools like GitHub to collaborate and, and Slack mm. so actually it's been it's been sort of fine with dev team and we seem to be we seem to be getting the same throughput uh, in fact in some ways we seem to be doing a little bit more work if I'm honest um, the biggest problem has probably been the IT support area and that's not really me motivating my team it's more us motivating the rest of the company because because we don't have that history of home working a lot of people in the company are like oh i'm working from home my wi-fi's not working um, i don't have a monitor my, my backrest of my chair's not working you know i'm not very good uh, and we've had to look at tools like zoom to, to to get people working you know understand what the best tool is for the business you know for example we, we use t- we would use teams because we're an office 365 uh, company but people don't really like it. So at the first, we were sort of trying to evaluate what's the best tool for people. Eventually, it did come down to Zoom because just people could just use it easily. It's so easy. Um, yeah. yeah, but but that's been the that's been the difficulty, I suppose, in some ways. It's actually been getting the com- the rest of the company working from home efficiently. Mm. Uh, well, I think we've done really well. We've, uh, yeah, everybody's quite happy. I think the first two were really stressful. You know, we had to understand how we get laptops shipped to people. How we how we fix their Wi-Fi, you know, when someone's at home, the Wi-Fi's not very good. If it's not really good, there's not a heck of a lot we can do about it. <laughs> yeah. But we can, you know, we can look at their uh, 
network speeds and, and send them out dongles, 4G dongles and that sort of thing and, and understand what the best way of doing that is. And the first two weeks were a bit stressful there, but, you know, we've, we've sort of mm -hmm. overcome that. Um, we've got, I mean, you know, I, I say the dev team are great and they're just getting on with things, but, you know, we've had, uh, we've, we've booked in a, a half hour or an hour slot on a, every Friday to just play games. So we'll just all get on them. Um, Get online and play Jackbox. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but we've got a bunch of games you can all play online. Um, we've had one of the devs that is on an ad hoc basis sets up. Um, that's over a beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we've also got I mean, the company also have bingo and quizzes on a our phone on a Friday as well with beer. So yeah, we, we'll do a bit our, of bingo. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we do that as well. Um, but you know, that's all been led by the team rather than me. Um, just I have encouraged the social aspect of the Friday just to get everybody together. I think um, so. Actually, think about it again. You know, I, I am making sure I carry on one to ones with people. Um, you know, in the office, it's sometimes one to ones will drop because you're seeing people a lot face to face. Sometimes it's not worth it. But now that we're not seeing each other a lot, I have made sure that those one to ones stay in. And um, some people are. You, you can tell some people are not as happy working from home, so it's it's quite important to make sure that they have regular contact with people uh, some people working from home on their own and they love it some people are on their own and they're missing company uh, yeah. and then there's, there's other people that are working with family and they hate it and want to go out to work <laughs> but you know <laughs> each other. um so yeah it's, I, I found it important to keep one to one's going and the other thing is um from a leadership uh, remote point of view i think i've learned not to be as as involved which is difficult because you don't get as much information coming at you just just through people talking. Mm. It's easy to feel out of control and like you don't know what's happening in the team. Um, and I felt like that quite a lot. But I've learned that there's no point in being on people's backs all the time and arranging daily meetings because people just get sick of it. You've got to trust that they know what they're doing and that the work is getting done. And then just make sure that I have catch-ups, one-to-ones, weekly or, you know, mm. or, Make sure I have a team. I've moved. We have a leadership team meeting for me and my direct members and staff, and that's moved to weekly now rather than bi weekly, uh, just so we can make sure that I'm across everything. But it is, yeah, just sort of keeping that hands off mentality, not being too, you know, why, why aren't you at your computer? I slapped you five minutes ago, you've got to, you need to stop that. Not helpful to you. It is hard though, isn't it? Because you don't have those little kind of catch ups and chats that you would have with someone if you just. Um, you know, you were getting a coffee from the kitchen at the same time or passing them in the corridor or hallway or, do you know? Um, yeah. It's, um, Plus, if someone's, if someone's gone for a coffee, they've gone to their kitchen and they might be a little wild and you don't know where they are. So it's like, whereas if they're in the office, oh, this is in the kitchen, I'll go have a chat. So yeah. you just yeah. stop yourself and go, they could be making a coffee, they could be having a toilet break, you know. <laughs> get back to me when they get a chance, you know. You've stopped yourself, haven't you, from uh, thinking all sorts and like you said, trust them, um, which I think is one of the great positives that's going to come out of this when we when we start um, entering more into a semi-normal or whatever can be normal um, way of working again. Um, so I would love to know, and I'm sure our listeners would love to know, you've come across as a very um, enthusiastic, passionate, go-getting go individual. What are you passionate about? Like, what makes you tick and what drives you? From a work point of view or a, or a personal point of view? Right. Um, I, from a work point of view, my biggest passion is putting together... I tell you, I want people to come to work because they want to come to work, mm. not because it's a job. Because the best jobs... Oh, that sounds really cool, but the best jobs I've ever done are jobs that don't feel like a job. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how to say that, that's a well, well trodden uh, uh, quote, but um, one of the questions I ask people in an interview is, you know, what, what makes you get out of bed in the morning? You know, when the, when the alarm goes off, what job makes you not want to snooze that and, and you know, have, have another 15 minutes in bed? Um, you know, I want to know what makes people happy coming to work, because I want people to come to work and enjoy it. I want people to look forward to it because it's the worst thing in the world is to wake up or, you know when you've got that that sunday night fear about oh god i've got to work tomorrow this weekend's been too short you know it's great if you can get to sunday night and think oh, that's been a good weekend but i've got to work tomorrow i'm quite happy to do that that sounds mm -hmm. so um but it's really important to me i'm quite passionate about that 
you know, I want to put together teams of people that get on and, you know, enjoy socialising as much as they do working together. You spend most of your life working at work with, with your colleagues. It's important, isn't it? That... Yeah, you probably see your work colleagues as much as you do your spouse or partner, don't you? you know, I guess. Yeah, so. Me and Sandra definitely see each other yeah. more than we see our partners. <laughs> we train together at 7 a.m. and then we don't stop texting until like 10 at night. <laughs> so it's, it's important, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. What about outside of work then? Well, normal, uh, you know, boring. I, I run and I cycle. Cycle's my passion, uh, that's what I do most. But I've sort of taken to running a lot more in this lockdown because it's easier. I can just go out on a lunch time and have a quick blast and then get in before, you know, 40 minutes or so. Uh, but cycling's my big passion. Um, hopefully I'll start doing a bit of that again. I'm not cycled for a while. Um, mm. Yeah. Have you uh, done any long, like, have you done any, like, kind of big long tracks or do you, are you off the, road or on road? Oh, 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 road. I used to be. I used to be a mountain biker. Now I do road biking. But yeah, I've done. So I did the the bike London ride a couple of times, which is a really good uh, ride. If anybody's a cyclist that listens to this, I thoroughly recommend that. It's closed roads around London. You get loads of spectators. It's it's mm. a really interesting, um, uplifting event. I've only ever done one, and it was the Great Yorkshire bike ride. It's, oh, yeah, I've done that. Have you done that? Or yeah, that's a great ride. Yeah. <laughs> It's really good fun because there's people, every sort of person turns up. Yeah, no yeah I enjoyed it because you have lo like loads of like pit stops, don't you, with other people? And yeah, get plenty of food. And, yeah, yeah, you get loads of food. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do that. Hopefully, we can do that next year. Then you know, it's about it's seventy odd miles. Yeah. Okay. Get on a tandem. <laughs> I've got my spin bike at home oh, now. I'll be ready for I'm it. I'm always up for stuff like that, but it's uh, but it was hard. I think it took yeah. me about seven hours. But I didn't have the best bike. I'd get a better bike if I did it again. Yeah, an <laughs> electric see, one. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I think I think people do do it electric bikes. I think that's how. Really, I mean. that's cheating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you mentioned this already earlier. I think it was when you were at Sky, but it'd be interesting to find out a little bit more detail about your greatest achievement today. I think putting together the digital agency team at Sky, mm -hmm. that was my first proper sort of um, high profile job. Um, you know, it's the first time I'd scrutiny from people of uh, high level in Sky. It's quite scary. Um, but I think the, the team that I put together, that I'm so proud of, I, I, I miss them all. Um, it, it was, it, it just seemed to work really well. It, it was, it was the most diverse team in Sky Leeds at the time, you know, for ethnicity and gender. Um, and everybody, it was like a family. I think we had the lowest retention rate in, in Sky at the time, in Leeds anyway. Um, and I'm just so proud of the, the, what we've managed to do with that team. And you know, they, they had a lot, of, a lot of issues in that team just with the work that they were doing and, and the, you know, the, the, the amount of conflicting priorities that they had. Um, mm. Yeah, really proud of the people there. And, you know, some of the people that are hiding that team have gone on to do some great things as well. I'm really proud of them. Um, so, yeah. Amadi was in that team, wasn't she? Yeah, but apart from her. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds yeah. like you're still really good, really close bunch with that team, though. Okay. Yeah. And I, to be fair, I'd, I'd have to I'd have to give Amadi a shout out because uh, yeah, she did for me in another podcast. So. <laughs> yeah. She, she's one of our favourites. <laughs> yeah, but she, you know, between her and you know the, the other people that were directly reporting to me, uh, uh, you know, uh, Leisha and um, and Scott, it, it, it was a really good team. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Ooh. What about then? You said that you suffered sort of with anxiety before and managing the stress of it all. But how do you kind of look after yourself and how do you keep yourself healthy when you're in such a high pressured environment? Particularly lab people, I imagine it's quite like a I guess it's a fast growing business, it's ever changing, every day must be different. How, how do you cope with all that? Uh, funnily enough, actually, Lab Bible's probably a little bit less pressured um, than Sky was. Uh, okay. I think the more, the more understanding of, of tech, because I can tell them my issues and they can see the issues, I can show them what the problems are. So, you know, yes, they, they, there is a lot of pressure to, to pivot quickly and do things. Um, but if it's if it's not doable, I can tell them that, and that's really liberating to be able to say to the bosses of the company, we're not going to be able to do that, at all. we can we can do it, but it's going to take this long. One thing I always say to them is, we can do anything you want, but it'll just take us 
very lengths of time. You know, if, you, if you've got the biggest idea, you want to create a new Facebook, yeah, we can do it. It's going to take us two years. Are you ready? Are you happy to do that? Yeah. It's going so, to cost so, a lot. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's, that's actually one of the ways that I deal with stress there is just by being as honest as possible with the, with the owners. You know, it goes back to the same thing with the team, transparency. You know, if, if they can understand what I'm going through and that what the team are going through, then there is less stress. You know, it, it was a, quite a low bar when I arrived. You know, we, we, we didn't have to do a lot to please them. We are getting to the point now where they're expecting a lot more of us, which is fair, which is, which is, which is right. Um, but, you know, deal with, I, I think that's one of the ways that I've dealt with stress. I, I, I used to get, I mean, you can talk to people that used to work with me uh, at Sky, especially in the early days. I didn't deal with stress at all well. Um, and I used to I used to actually shout in the middle of the office and I used to, I, I've, I've been known to throw things around. Now that Really? Of, yeah, yeah. Uh, people people don't believe that now because I'm, I'm such a happy, smiling person. But um yeah, I definitely didn't used to deal with stress very well. Uh yeah, you know, I used to have arguments with people in the middle of the office. Now I look back at that now and that actually held me back. Uh, this sort of ties into that, you know, what, what advice would you give people or the leaders? You have to keep calm. You cannot. You have lost an argument as soon as you start shouting with someone in a business. Um, and I only started, you know, creeping up that career ladder when I learned to calm down and learned that mm. it's, it's not all personal. You know, it's business. You know, if someone wants this thing doing, then they're having pressure from some other part of the company, and you know, you've just got to realise that it's not aimed at you personally. Some things sometimes are, but. Uh, <laughs> So I've been in that position, you just have to take it on the chin, don't you? And just, yeah, like make the best. Yeah. But I've, I've learned that, you know, when that, when that little inner demon starts flaring up, when you, you, you know, you've been dealt a, a really stressful situation, you just got to, you just got to keep calm. And, and even if it's on the surface, just keep calm and, and you know, talk it through. Uh, and and I, it sounds quite hypocritical because I do, you know, I've, I've say this earlier i struggle sleeping and uh, most of the time it's because work's going around in my head all the time mm. i have dreadful issues i have most of my life um which is quite stressful but uh you know mm. I, 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 in the work environment i've definitely calmed down a lot that probably just comes from getting older to be honest but um mm -hmm. yeah i think you know and exercise to be honest you know not everybody is willing to do this but exercise definitely helps with stress um I went for a run at lunchtime today and I, I feel so much better this afternoon than I did this morning. Um, you know, I, just getting those endorphins. And I sound like a self-help guru now, don't I? <laughs> yeah, go, go, well, out, go out and do some exercise. Yeah, we, yeah. We've been doing a morning workout um, every, for like five days a week, haven't we, Ellen? It just, it just, I do feel Six like days, most week. We normally do six, don't we? It sets you up. For the day um and yeah yeah we, we do one on we try and do one on a weekend on a saturday or sunday and even then like like last weekend i had a few drinks on saturday but i felt better about it like knowing yes. that i've done my workout and um yeah it's all about your mind isn't it and um yeah but i think i think you know that's my takeaway i i i, I, I as i say it's probably a, a result of aging but um, i i've learned just to sort of when i know those triggers that get me Mm. and upset and stressed and just sort of it's just a knowing that that triggers there and what it is and how it feels inside you know, yeah I'm, I'm getting annoyed now probably need to just calm down for a second and, uh, and it's interesting it, i guess because you could because you've had that yourself and you've gone through it i guess when you're managing and you're leading others and and people that are kind of suffering with the same things and sometimes the stress gets on top of them and they let it show i guess at least you can talk about to how you used to do that and how you've changed your behaviors um, yeah it's, it's also worth, I, I started using a technique, and I can't remember where I got it from now, but if someone says something to you that you fundamentally disagree with or that raises your anxiety levels, don't reply straight away. <laughs> I know it sounds really simple, but I, I definitely put that into a practice at one point, you know, that I was, I was having one to one with someone that would say something quite inflammatory. On it. Just, just <laughs> to sit in quiet for a couple of seconds, and either you will calm down and give them an appropriate response as a manager, or they'll fill the gap by if you apologising. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so it'd be nice to just really finish off with. Um, obviously, been with Lab Bible now for a couple of years. Um, I'm sure you um probably had some great um plans um in the pipeline. I don't know if they've been affected by the recent 
situation or not but um what's what's big kind of on your agenda or what like what excites you at the moment about what's due ahead like what big plans have you got coming up so uh, things have changed with uh, what's going on now because we've got more people on the website we've got a bigger audience we uh, you know people sat at home looking at our products uh, uh, plus the the owners are sat at home not bored but you know they've got more time to think about things you know the nice thing is normally they'd go from meeting to meeting and they talk to people but now they've got a bit of time to step back and think about the you know, direction of plans um we are going to look at uh, increasing our uh, video content on our website because at the moment we're you know, well known as a, a company that supply videos to facebook but if you go to our website it's pretty sparse for videos so we're going to try and sort of increase our video content there. Um, and we've got an app uh, that's on the App Store now that we um, released about six months ago, maybe less, four months ago. Now we've had no promotion at all. Um, so yeah, this is me promoting now. But uh, we've got steadily more numbers on there. It's, it's basically just an app that shows all our video and uh, you can search the video. Now- Do you subscribe? Uh, is it like a subscription then? Nope, you don't have to lock it or anything at the, at the moment. Um, there's no advertising on it, but it's just all the videos that Lad Bible produce and put on Facebook. Oh. And now, it's quite embryonic stages. We've MB, MVP'd it. You know, we've, we've, we've put yeah. out minimum we possibly can. We've got a lot of good ideas of things to do with that. Um, I won't go That's right. cool. I'm not sure I can, but um, yeah, I'm really excited to see what we can do with that in the next year. Yeah, that's really exciting. And I think things like Lab Bible at the moment, and it's like all the gifts and all the memes that you see now, they're just like little things that make people's day when they're in such like, we're obviously all in situations locked down. There's a lot of people on furlough or on their phones and feeling a bit glum, but the content that Lab Bible put out, it genuinely does put a smile on your face, doesn't it? So it's usually yeah. interesting, oh, funny. I mean, so. well, the other thing is we've got a lot of original content now and uh, there's, there's, we're actually producing series, uh, there's one called Agree to Disagree, where we get two people with opposing opinions, uh, they have a chat, which is great, we've got... Um, I've seen that actually, I've seen it, was it, um, I think it was, um, was it a, a priest and someone that worked in the sex industry or something? That yeah, I think yes, yes. <laughs> that was, yes. We had, yeah. we, had a, we had a scientist versus a flat earther, which was interesting as well. <laughs> we've also got a series called The Gap, uh, which is where we'll get... Um, so one example is a, someone that's just come out of the army and someone that was like a, an old a veteran of the army and they'll chat about their experiences and how it differs oh. uh, and these are really good quality high high you know um things that really don't we don't have a, a place on our website our app to put them so we, we're hoping to get more coverage of those in the apple website amazing super cool Fantastic. All right, great. Well, Mark, it's been fantastic for having you on. So thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. Um, if any of the listeners or viewers do want to get in touch, is it best to reach out on LinkedIn, Twitter? LinkedIn, What's best? yeah. LinkedIn yeah? is LinkedIn. best. Uh, yeah, Mark Kitchen, it's K-I-T-C-H-I-N-G. That's the yeah. push spell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great. It's been fab having you on. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, no worries. Mark. Thank you very much. Cheers. Perfect. Thank you very much for listening.